What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, or welcome to another audiobook. Now we are on to the scoop. Oh my gosh, this is the second story in Felix the Shark, which is the last book. This is technically the penultimate story. That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> there's been 36 stories made, in, uh, not including Stitch Ray Stingers, of course. But uh, this one is... I, I want to say it's like the weirdest one out of all of them. But not in like weird in a way you think. Like... I think you'll you'll see what I mean by the end of this, but this one, it, like, don't go into this with any expectations. It's going to surprise you in a weird way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you enjoy this audiobook, then make sure that you subscribe so that you see when I upload the last, aka You're the Band. I still need to finish the Fetch audiobooks as well, but I will do that uh, hopefully by May. Uh, that's the plan anyway. And then we'll be on to... Uh, Tales from the Pizza Plex when it comes out in, I think, July, August, maybe. I don't know. Um, but anyway, let's get straight into the scoop. I'm so excited for this one. Mandy Mason shifted in her school desk's chair as she tugged on a strand of her hair that loosened from her two sci-fi styled buns. She was in the midst of writing a serious fan fiction scene for the animatronic game series Five Nights at Freddy's. Yes, it's another one of these fourth wall breaking stories. <laughs> well, not necessarily because of uh, FNAF VR. It's like a VR game in the FNAF universe. Anyway, you get what I mean. She paused her pencil on her notebook, flicking her eyes toward Mr. Peterson as he got up from his desk to speak to a student. Yeah, she was supposed to be doing homework like the other students during study period, but this scene was literally flashing in front of her eyes, begging to be written. Her phone vibrated with a message, so she covertly slipped it from her skirt pocket and tucked the phone below the desktop to read the screen. OMG, did you read Freak Story's latest fic? So good, yours is better. Thanks, gotta go. This is Total Misfit and M Squared, by the way. Mandy, what are you working on? Mr. Peterson leaned over her. Mandy dropped her phone in her lap and crossed her chunky black boots. Um, English, sir? Let's have a look. He grabbed her notebook before she could stop him. Hmm. The animatronic looked dead, but in all reality, the bear watched and waited for the perfect opportunity to grab the little boy from across the room. Mandy smiled in discomfort as the other students in the room laughed. She cleared her throat as her cheeks heated. Just a creative writing prompt, Mr. Peterson. He furrowed his eyebrows and shook his head. Let's get to the real work now, Mandy. I'm sure Mrs. Gentry isn't assigning you an animatronic bear essay. More laughter erupted in the classroom. Right, Mandy murmured. Mr. Peterson closed the notebook and slipped it back on her desk as he walked away. Fan fiction. So original, just like her pink hair. That must be why she thinks up such great stories. Melissa Chandler whispered a little too loudly from the desk behind Mandy. Mandy gave a quiet sigh. Here we go again. It's like someone threw up diarrhea meds on her head. Lily Jansen giggled back. <laughs> uh, oh wait, is that what happened to you, Mandy? Mandy looked down at her notebook, rubbing the tip of her eraser across the cover. I died, but I dyed it because it looks better with my complexion. You should try it sometime. Right, like I need help with my complexion. Melissa leaned forward toward uh, Mandy's shoulder. You're a real freak show. You know that mace head. A freak with different coloured eyes. The girls both laughed. It was true. Mandy had been born with heterochromia. <laughs> That's a really cool word. With one brown iris and one green iris. Having two different eye colours really hadn't been an issue with other kids as she grew up until she met, uh, until she met Melissa. Then again, Melissa seemed to take issue with everything about Mandy. Mandy shrugged, even though she felt tension grip her body inch by inch. By now, she was an ace at not showing her emotions. It had taken some time and more than a few hurtful comments, though. I'll take that as a compliment. You would, Melissa said. Why are you such a freak? Lily wanted to know. Mandy forced a smile. Lucky, I guess. More like cursed, Melissa said. And the, bu and the girls both laughed. Yeah, 
podcast to deal with you for the past three years. Melissa is a lot like everyone else at Donovan Prep School for Girls. Smart and pampered, ex- except Melissa was over the top perfect and the richest girl in school. Her red hair was styled with blunt bangs, the straight edges of her hair brushing her shoulders. Her makeup was just the right shade for her pale skin tone, and her blue eyes were so razor sharp that she could pretty much rip a girl to shreds with a single look. Even worse, other mean girls like Lily orbited around her like she was some sort of evil star. As for Mandy, her parents did well enough financially to send her to Donovan Prep. Even though it wasn't her style, she wore the school's obligatory uniform, played skirt, white sh- shirts, cardigan and knee-high socks, but she rebelled in her own way by dyeing her hair. This week it was cotton candy pink. If the Mean Girls were going to make a big deal that she was a little different, then she'd all go out. Uh, s- sorry, she'd go all out. <laughs> the DP rulebook never stated regulations on hair colour. Besides, it wasn't like she was a bad kid. She was a straight-A student, but apparently she didn't have the right looks, eye colour included, to fit in. Mandy tried to remember how it all came to be that Melissa hated her. It had been three years of bullying and been and mean mara- remarks. Had it been because she aced out Melissa on a test their fresh freshman year? Or was it when she answered a question Melissa didn't know during history class? Whatever the case, Melissa had marked Mandy for life with a big fat bullseye. When the bell rang, Mandy grabbed her backpack and quickly made her way out of class to her locker, leaving behind the annoying giggles of Melissa and Lily. A pathway of students opened when she walked by as if she was some weird creature to avoid. No one wanted to risk the wrath of Melissa Chandler to befriend Mandy. Most days Mandy felt like a human sacrifice offered up at the altar of Melissa's cruelty. The other girls knew she was Melissa's favourite target and there was no way they wanted to take Mandy's place. Mandy couldn't really blame them. At her locker, Mandy pulled out her longboard, longboard exchanged uh, books and shut the metal door. A folded paper had slipped from her locker and dropped to the ground. She picked it up and opened the paper to see a printout of a skinny, odd-looking dog, with its tongue hanging out and its eyes bulging. One eye was coloured green and the other brown. Pink buns were drawn over the ears and mace head was printed in bold letters above the picture. Mandy crumbled the paper and grabbed her board, slipped her rainbow backpack to one shoulder and headed down the hall toward the lobby of Donovan Prep. She tossed the crumbled picture in the garbage can on the way out. In the afternoon sun, she hooked her rainbow backpack onto both shoulders, dropped her board and rolled on the sidewalk toward home. She pulled a licorice from her backpack and chewed on it as she made a mental list of what she needed to do for the rest of the day. Finish government econ homework. Finish the latest fanfic story. Write a new entry on her blog, The M&M Scoop. That's right, guys. This story... Actually, never mind. (laughs) I won't say that because it's kind of a spoiler, but not a spoiler. Um, 20 minutes later, she walked through the front door of her home and closed it at her back, leaning against the door. All the window shades were closed, making the large house seem dark and isolated. She rolled her board into the front closet. Her mum hated when she left it out and dropped her backpack on the settee. Settee. <clears throat> she wandered into the kitchen and grabbed a bottled water and a fresh handful of licorice from the pantry. Luckily, her folks were cool like that and made sure she was always fully stocked. Her phone rang with a video call. When she answered, her mother's face flashed on the screen. Your hair is pink, Mum said instead of hello. Mandy smiled. You noticed. What was wrong with the black? At least it was some semblance of normal. Oh, you know, that was my emo phase, Mum. <laughs> her mum lifted her eyebrows. And what do you call this phase? She shrugged. Pastel? Mandy, how's work? Work was always the same with mum, busy, 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 but at least it got the focus off Mandy and her mum's subtle disapproval. Mum sighed. Busy as usual, I'll be home for the weekend, before my trip to Utah next week. Utah? (laughs) Mum worked as a managing rep for one of the biggest pharma... Sorry. Pharmaceutical... Oh, oh, yeah, pharmaceutical companies in the business. Her job was a constant tr- was constant travel, overseeing reps and taking a bunch of meetings all the time, where apparently large amounts of medicine were talked about. At least that was what Mandy knew about it. Mom often missed out on a lot of 
stuff at home, but mum and dad had always said their jobs were what provided their wonderful home, Mandy's schooling, and the lives they wanted. Okay, mum, sounds good. Mandy, please stop bouncing. You're giving me motion sickness. Sorry. Mandy stilled the best she could. Sometimes she couldn't help her urges to fidget or bounce. I talked to your father in between meetings. He wanted to tell you it looks like it will be another late one for him tonight. Mandy shrugged off the disappointment. That's okay. There's frozen meals in the fridge. I know. Mandy spun around on one foot. Don't just eat licorice for dinner. How's school? Mandy paused and crossed her ankles. Amazing. Her mum said. Good. Oh, I, I gotta go, sweetie. I'll touch base with you tomorrow. Don't stay up too late. I won't, mum. Bye. In her room, Mandy twirled around in her desk chair, pushing one foot on the carpet as she spun in a circle with one licorice hanging out of her mouth. She had Mr. Happy, an old blue stuffed Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hippo. She had a Mr. Happy, an old blue stuffed elephant that used to be her brother's, clutched under her arm as she played for NAF 3 on her phone. <laughs> I love this story so much. It's so fourth wall breaking. <laughs> Mandy had always loved playing computer and mobile games. She could be anyone she wanted to be, go anywhere she pleased and solve problems in every way imaginable. Truthfully, gameplay had become her escape from all the drama at school and from her real life, where it often seemed like she had no control at all. One summer, she'd stumbled upon the FNAF community, yay! Die-hard gamers who loved the series for its scares, who played the games habitually, wrote the fanfiction, and theorised about the game lore. The online community loved trying to unravel hidden mysteries within the FNAF universe. I bet you can tell why this is a scrap story now. <laughs> Honestly, this, like, this is probably why this is a scrap story. She had to admit she was pretty new to the technical side of gaming. She didn't know all the coding stuff, but she was an excellent researcher. She had discovered an online decompiler that broke down the source code of certain games. At the moment, she was waiting on the decompiler to do just that for FNAF 3. She had watched a video game theorist <laughs> who'd found clues in other FNAF games' code. She thought this was a super cool idea, so she was trying it out for the first time on her own. Her laptop pinged and she stopped spinning in her chair. There was a notification about a new post to her favourite FNAF forum on Gamers Unite. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to cut, so we're back down here. <laughs> uh, when she saw it was posting about a mysterious missing kid, her excitement took a nosedive. Missing kids were a dime a dozen in FNAF, but since she was bored, she clicked on it anyway. The posting was about a five-year-old boy who had gone missing 17 years ago. Apparently there were conflicting details that a man in purple may have kidnapped him. Mandy made a face. A purple man? Like William Afton? <laughs> uh, right then, the decompiler notified her the file was complete. Eagerly, she clicked on it, the data it created for FNAF 3 and an explosion of images, textures and small files opened. Whoa! Mandy reached over and grabbed her framed photo of her brother that sat on her desk and put his tiny face to the screen. Look at this, Bobby! Pretty cool, huh? She set his photo back down and attempted to save the data. Dang it! The files for the game were too large to be saved on her laptop, so she started to go through the files online. <laughs> Relatable. She wasn't sure what she was looking for, but she'd know it when she found it. Probably. She bit down on a licorice and tugged off a mouthful as she checked out the content. The files were mostly images and sounds from the game. She yawned and took a sip of her water bottle. As she was skimming through the bulk of data, an image called lookshauntednow.jpg caught her interest. Lifting her eyebrows, she clicked on the image. A colourless photo of an old metal building opened up on the screen. What is this? she murmured. She's, she zoomed in to the photo the best she could before it became pixelated, looking for something to tell her of the location. The building was pretty run down. The door paint looked chipped, and there was a crack in one of the front windows. There was a street name too, Willow Something Road, she murmured. Why would this photo be in the files of FNAF 3? The point was, it shouldn't be. Mandy suddenly shook with the excitement in her desk chair, tapping the boots on, her on the carpet. 
she actually found something from the game that didn't belong. Something she hadn't seen online yet. Was this clue left by the creator? Was this building supposed to mean something to the game lore? People were going to freak. Immediately, she downloaded the photo and saved. She logged on to a FNAF forum and uploaded the picture. Subject. Hot FNAF 3 find. You guys will never guess what I found. Something new in the files of FNAF 3. Have you seen this before? What do you think this photo means? How do you think it's related to the game story? Give me all your ideas. Help. It's basically a Redditor. <laughs> now nah, Redditor is more toxic. Uh, Mandy was so excited. She once again reached for the old photo of her brother and ran her finger down the frame. I can't believe I actually found something. What do you think it means about the game? Where do you think the location is? Do you think it has something to do with the main storyline or maybe this is a teaser for something new? So many questions, you know. Stay here, she set Bo Bobby's picture down next to her. We have a lot of research to do. An hour later, Mandy yawned and stretched in her chair. She wrote a quick entry for her blog, then looked at the time. Yikes, it was later than she thought. She forgot to do her homework. Something red flashed in her peripheral vision by her bed and she whipped her head around. What was that? She saw her full bed against the wall. Her game posters were pinned over it. Her tall dresser and polka dot bean bag were in their usual places by the door. It was as if she had spotted something move and then it had disappeared into thin air. A chill swept over her and she shivered. I'm just tired, she thought and she'd spent the last five hours reviewing files from a horror game. Of course she was going to get spooked. Government econ homework was the perfect thing to give her some grounding, if it didn't put her to sleep first. Until tomorrow, FNAF world. <laughs> she said, and closed her laptop. I love this story so much. It's great. Okay. M&M &M scoop entry number 216. Something beyond cool happened. I was going through the decompiled files of FNAF 3 and I found something I don't think belongs. It's a photo of an old mysterious building. I could only make out part of the street name in the old photo, so I'm going to have to do some serious research to find the actual location. I'm asking around for answers. I'll keep you posted on what I discover. I am so excited, Eminem. Mandy clambered downstairs the next morning for breakfast, yawning and, and bleary-eyed. Following the smell of coffee and the toast her father actually liked burnt, she turned into the kitchen and spotted her dad in a dark blue suit and tie. He was reading the latest news on a tablet as he leaned against the kitchen island. His blonde hair seemed to shine under the kitchen lights, reminding her that under the pink hair she had his same colouring. Good morning, Mandy Bear, he said, eyeing her. Late night, Mandy nodded and opened the fridge to grab the milk. She shuffled to the pantry and pulled out the chocolate puffs. Dad grabbed a bowl and spoon and set it down for her at the island counter. You and I are, lu are sorry. You and I are lucky your mother isn't here to see you. You'd get busted for staying up late, and I'd get busted for letting you. Mandy squinted at him. He was freshly shaved and showered. His hair was already blown dry and combed neatly. Most days he got up early and hit the treadmill, so she knew he'd probably already been up for two hours. You had to work late. How come you're not even tired? He smiled and winked. I was born to live on five hours of sleep, kiddo. How's that possible? She muttered, pouring cereal in the milk. And why couldn't I get that gene? It's my personal superpower, her dad shrugged. So, tell me, how did mum like the pink? Manny became suddenly fascinated by her cereal. She loved it. Really? Mandy nodded as she wiped milk from her chin. Hmm. Dad eyed her in disbelief, but didn't prod the matter as he sipped from his cup. So dad, you're good at solving problems. That's what I do for a living. Why? Got a school project dilemma? Lay it on me, cupcake. Well, I, I, I was sort of investigating this game. I found a photo within the guts of the game that wasn't part of the actual game. What do you make of that? So, not schoolwork. Her dad took another sip. I don't know, Mandy. Sometimes I think programmers just leave junk in there, right? things they don't use. Not everything in there is a clue waiting to be found. Mandy snapped awake. Yeah? Like, maybe someone didn't want it to be found? Dad looked suddenly hesitant. Why? This photo is not something illegal, is it? <laughs> no, Dad. Sheesh. What kind of person do you think I am? His eyes widened. Do you really want me to answer that? Mandy smiled. Maybe not. I do have pink hair. 
So, nothing unique about the photo then. Nothing that I can tell. Just a random building that could be anywhere. Dad sipped his coffee. That's kind of what I was getting at. It's possible the building was used for the game in a way that you weren't aware of. Like inspiration. Inspiration, she murmured. In interesting. He set down his coffee mug and scooped up his briefcase. That's all of my brilliant ideas for today, kiddo. Have a great day at school. Don't get arrested. He pecked her cheek on the way out of the kitchen. I have a meeting schedule later than usual. It could run over. It's all right, Dad. Maybe I'll see you for dinner. She smiled again. Yeah, okay. They both knew that wasn't likely. Monday's school day seemed to go by in a blur. She found herself zoning out <laughs> during classes. She was tired, true, but she was more than just distracted. Uh, turning over the possible meanings of the mysterious building she'd discovered. She was dying to see if other fans had responded to her post. The idea that she could have found a piece of important game lore was so exciting. When the last bell rang, she sprang up and rushed to her locker. The faster she could get out of there, the quicker she could get home and back to the forums. She spun the locker combo and whipped open the small door. Something popped from the inside and wet goop flung out, splattering her face and chest. Fazgu? Mandy dropped her backpack and stood frozen in shock. A burst of applause sounded around her. Mandy wiped goop from her face and her hands came away with green slime. She dripped glo uh, gobs of it to the floor and spit out the slime that had been flown into her mouth. The goop smelled like toothpaste mixed with shaving cream, but she couldn't be sure. She turned to hear girls clapping and laughing as embarrassment plummeted inside her. She had the urge to run. She wanted to scream at them all. Just leave me alone. But she could only stand there and be the freak show they believed her to be. Sure enough, when Mandy cleared her eyes, she saw Melissa standing at the centre of it all. Melissa was barely four foot ten and pretty much looked like a little evil doll as she cackled. No wonder Melissa and Lily had been strangely quiet during study period. No need to bash Mandy during class when they had this to look forward to. Melissa strolled up to Mandy, her red hair swaying side to side. Wow, what happened to you, Macehead? She clucked her tongue. You've created quite the mess. You're a real menace to DP, you know. When are you going to realise you don't belong here, freak? Mandy started to shake. A teacher walked out of the classroom and Melissa slipped away quickly. What happened here? Mrs. Gentry asked in astonishment. She looked at Mandy and the mess on the floor. Who did this? Mandy wanted to point her finger right at Melissa and her gaggle of friends, but she was too upset, too unsteady. If she talked right at this moment, she might explode on everyone, just like the green slime from her locker. She had no proof it was Melissa and her friends anyway. Mandy merely shook her head. Come on, let's get you to the office and cleaned up. Move along, everyone. Get going, or it'll be my pleasure to start putting people in for questioning. A few minutes later, Mandy had calmed down enough to talk to the secretary. No, she didn't want the office to call her parents. She told them her mum was out of town and her dad was on him. It was in important meetings and couldn't be bothered, which was true. No, she didn't want to know who had done this. She didn't know who had done this to her, which was sort of untrue. Uh, she washed off the best she could in the office bathroom. Her throat tightened when she realised the green wasn't coming off her face all the way. Her pink hair was now spotted with green. She just had to get out of there and get home. She stopped by her locker to salvage what she could. The janitor was there, mopping the floor, smearing green everywhere. This had better come off, he muttered to Mandy like it was all her fault. Just get your stuff out and I'll try and clean it the best I can, but no promises it will all come off. Mandy thought he muttered something about rich kids, but she wasn't sure. She threw away some papers into the garbage can the janitor had provided as well as the weird tube contraction that shot green goop at her. That was when she realised her longboard was gone. She blew out a frustrated breath. She was barely keeping it together. She, but she would not break at school. She wouldn't give Missa the, M Missa? Melissa the satisfaction. She grabbed the rest of her stuff and placed it in a fresh garbage bag she'd gotten from the secretary. She stopped by the office to report her missing long build, then left to walk home. She ignored the weird looks she got from pedestrians. As she replayed the explosion of her locker over and over in her mind, she began walking faster. The pain and humiliation seemed to spread throughout her body like wildfire, and she ran as fast as she could to make it all go away. It was the fastest she could ever remember running in her life. At home, Mandy took a shower and att attempted to scrub all the green out of her hair and off her skin. 
The green dye eventually came off her skin, but it had stained her freshly dyed pink hair. As she stared into the mirror, her eyes burned, but she blinked the sensation away. Fine, I'll just go purple tonight before bed. I love purple. Everything will be fine. <laughs> this is actually a story about, like, someone who dyes their hair purple and then they start killing kids. Like, <laughs> like they've been possessed by the purple dye. Um, she turned away, gathered up her stained uniform and threw it in a garbage bag. She washed the stickiness off her boots. There was no cleaning the backpack though. And she wasn't about to explain this incident to her parents. She'd just have to deal with the green splattered rainbow backpack for the rest of the school year. When she was done cleaning up, she sat at her computer and looked at Bobby's picture. It was a bad day, Bobby. She took a big breath to keep the sadness at bay. I, I don't know what to do. If I tell dad what happened... He'll tell mom, and then mom will fly back, and it will just be an even bigger mess. I just wish you were here with me. Sometimes I feel like you're the only one who I can really talk to. Mandy picked up the picture again. Her brother smiled up at her, just three weeks old, in blue footy pyjamas. Usually, talking to Bobby made her feel better, but there was an emptiness in her tonight that threatened to swallow her whole. Shaking her head, she logged in to the FNAF forums. She was ready to dive back into the comfort of her favourite world and forget everything and everyone from today. She didn't care about anyone at DP. The forums were where her people were, right? Subject. Hot FNAF 3 find. No way this is real. I decompiled the game before and I never saw this. Cool, I'll have to check this out. Great find. An old building. Wow. Big deal. Thumbs down. I tried to find it and couldn't. You sure you got this from FNAF 3? Yeah, me too. Couldn't find it. Mandy frowned at the comment she received from her post the night before. It had 43 downvotes. On this... Uh, sorry. Oh, this day just keeps getting better and better. What do they mean they couldn't find it? Mandy wondered. The photo had been in the de decompiled files of FNAF 3. It didn't belong to the game and anyone obsessed with FNAF knew that. Her phone rang for a video chat request from Lindy. Lindy, aka Total Misfit, was a friend she met online the past year. They kept running into each other in the FNAF forums and fanfiction site. Soon they started messaging each other and then they recently started video chatting. The only problem was that they lived two states away from each other and had never met in person. And with the distance, they probably wouldn't meet anytime soon. Oh, and Mandy learned right away that, at least with Mandy, Lindy was not a, mo a Total Misfit at all. She was also the kindest person Mandy had met in a long time. When Mandy answered, Lindy's full uh, circular glasses filled the screen. She had rich brown skin with black hair and brown eyes. Her purple frames were always falling down her nose. And, uh, oh, sorry. And Mandy continually watched her push them back up with her finger. Hi, Mandy. What you doing? <laughs> I can't believe I gave her that voice. Trying to figure out why no one can find that photo I posted from FNAF 3. Lindy sipped from her soda can. That was such a cool find. Mandy's eyes widened. Did you find it too? Lindy shook her head. Haven't tried. I've been swamped with homework this week. Well, I'm decompiling the game again to see what happened. It was the only thing that looked out of place in the files. I can't believe people think I'm making this up. They're all just jealous you found it, and they didn't. That, or there's a glitch somewhere. I wouldn't worry about it. Besides, shouldn't we all be focusing on what the photo is instead of where it came from? Oh, by the way, you should try a reverse image search when you have a sec. Maybe you can find out where the photo originated from. I'll send you the link on how to do it. Mandy felt a bubble of excitement. Really? Cool, thanks. Sure. Lindy squinted. Did you dye your hair pink and green? Mandy ran a hand through her damp hair. Not exactly. Oh, okay. Something like a science experiment gone wrong, right? Mandy smiled. Lindy had this way of making light of things. And Mandy appreciated that. Pretty much. Hate when that happens. So, you up for a game of 20 questions? Lindy asked. I got some time. 20 questions had been their way of getting to know each other better over the last few months. You go first. Okay. What's your favourite ice cream? Easy. Fudge brownie is king. What's yours? Mint choc chip. Non-dairy. I'm lactose intolerant. Mandy made an O oh shape with her mouth and nodded. Do you have your driver's licence? Yeah. My dad made me get it right away. He said we all needed to know how to be independent. Don't you have yours? Mandy shook her head. Not yet. I just have my permit. 
My mum keeps bugging me, but I freak out every time I'm on the road, which hasn't been a lot lately. It's on my to-do list. Do you have any siblings? Two. Two? Wow. Yeah, I'm the middle child. According to my psychology class, I have a need for attention. Lindy shrugged and pushed her glasses up her nose. Not so sure about that. You have any siblings? Um, well, not anymore. Oh, Min Lindy's eyes widened behind her lenses. I'm so sorry, what happened? Is it okay to ask? I mean, I don't want to be... No, it's okay. My brother died when he was a baby and I never got to meet him. They're not really sure why he died. Sometimes babies just don't make it, I guess. Lindy nodded. I'm so sorry. I can't imagine not having my brothers around me, even if they are completely annoying. What are their names? James and Thomas. What was your brother's name? Bobby. She switched the phone over to her desk, showing Lindy the photo of Bobby. This is him. Totally cute in baby blue pyjamas. Thanks. Mandy walked out of her room, twirling a lock of hair around her finger as she strolled downstairs to the kitchen to grab a water. What's it like to have brothers anyway? Lindy pursed her lips and looked upward as if she was thinking about it. Well, they're loud and smelly and mine like to wrestle. Sometimes they steal your fries and definitely invade your privacy. One time, my older brother stole my diary and read it out loud to the whole family. I got him called I got him back by calling a girl he liked, but was too scared to call. He wouldn't talk to me for a week, but he got over it. To Mandy that all sounded wonderful. She often dreamed of growing up with Bobby as a big brother. How they'd always be together, playing games, hanging out. Maybe they would even get on each other's nerves. Her heart gave a little clench every time she thought about it and knew it would never happen. But other times, they can stick up for you when your parents get on your case or when you need some cheering up. And one of them is always around. I'm never by myself, which, is, which can also be super annoying. Family is family, though. Family is family, Mandy thought. From the fridge, she grabbed a bottle then walked to the living room and plopped on the couch. Oh, hey, I gotta go. Mum's calling me. I'll message you later. Coming, Mum. Okay. Lindy was suddenly gone. Mandy set her phone in her lap as she sat in the middle of her large, empty living room, completely alone. She started to stare into space, imagining Bobby still alive and grown just like her. He'd have dark hair like Mum, and he'd have been tall and slim like Dad. Maybe he'd crack jokes and maybe he'd be into video games or some kind of star athlete. Something flickered at the top of the staircase, catching Mandy's attention. A small blue shoe was on the top step. Mandy sat up quickly on the couch and watched it shift out of view. One second it was there, and by two seconds it was gone. Mandy got up and moved slowly to the hall closet, where her dad kept a baseball bat. After grabbing the bat, she crept up the stairs, gripping the railing hard with her free hand. She looked down the hallway, then searched each room and bathroom, trying to understand what she had seen. When she had looked everywhere uh, she could and didn't find suspicious little blue shoes or the person wearing them, she just shook her head. I've been playing too much for NAF. <laughs> Same. Um, that evening, after dyeing her hair from cotton candy pink slime green to a passionate purple, Mandy searched again through the newly re-decompiled FNAF 3 files one by one looking for the picture of the metal building. This time she was going to take a screenshot of the discovery so others would believe that it came straight from the game's files. Then she'd have solid proof to show everyone she wasn't lying. Only problem was, she couldn't seem to find it. Where is it? It had been there just last night. She hadn't created it out of thin air. When she got to the end of the files, her head started to throb, but she didn't care. She started right from the beginning again to see if she accidentally skimmed over it. Second time though, she still couldn't find the picture, defeated. She slouched back in to her desk chair. How could it be there one night and then gone the next? She rubbed her eyes with her fingers. How was anybody going to believe her when the proof was gone? She didn't understand how it could have suddenly disappeared. She logged back into the forum and updated her thread. Subject, hot FNAF 3 find, not so much. Guys, I don't know what happened. The photo was really there in the game's files last night. Now it's just gone. Disappeared. Like someone took it from the files. I'm not sure why. She felt stupid. Why had she posted the photo so quickly? Why hadn't she taken a screenshot for proof the night before? Gamers Unite was her safe and happy place where she could be herself. Now she was suddenly looking like some kind of flake that no one believed. Why are you such a freak show, Mandy? 
Her eyes started to burn again, so she blinked a few times. She inhaled and blew out a slow breath, then squared her shoulders. This wasn't going to stop her from finding out where the picture had came, come from. She knew the picture had been in the FNAF 3 files, even if no one else believed her, that it was real. It had to mean something to the game law, or to be connected to the FNAF universe in some way. Maybe it was like her dad had said. It was there for a reason the players weren't aware of, like for inspiration. She clicked on the link Lindy had sent to her and started the reverse image search. She put the strange looks haunted now.jpg image through a search engine to see where the photo might have originated, or even where this building was actually located. After a couple of minutes, several links appeared, pages and facts, with possible leads. The list kept growing. This was going to take forever. Goosebumps rose on her arms, and she shivered in her chair. She was suddenly super cold. She sighed, spinning her chair around to get a sweat, sweater and froze. Peering around the corner into her bedroom was a small child looking at her. Mandy held her breath and didn't dare move. The child looked to be a boy about five or six with brown hair. He was tucked behind the doorway, covering most of his body. She saw his little hand gripping the door jam, the shoulder of his bright red shirt. One eye peered at her. She blinked and he was gone. Mandy realised the breath, uh, sorry, Mandy released the breath she'd been holding and started to tremble in astonishment. She waited a moment to see if he would appear again, but he didn't. She pushed herself up out of the desk chair and slowly walked to her doorway, stepping out into the hall. She wasn't sure what she expected to see, but all she saw was her normal hardwood floor and eggshell covered walls. That was super weird, she whispered, then ducked back into her room, shut the door and locked it. Mandy awoke in the dark, her heart pounding, but she wasn't in her bed. She was lying on a hard floor in her pyjamas, freezing. She pushed to her bare feet with a shiver, trying to understand where she could be. This wasn't her house either. She could sense the space around her was too large, too open. She reached out with her hands as she walked, hoping she wouldn't run into anything. She finally felt the wall and glided her hands across the cold, grimy surface as she took small steps. Her eyes began to adjust and she realised she was in some kind of warehouse or large building. A faint yellow light checked on, uh, sorry, clicked on, huh? <laughs> in a large area making her blink to adjust to the strange lighting. She spotted a box of animatronic heads and body parts on a black and white checkered floor. No way, she whispered. She was pretty sure she recognised Fazbear's Fright, the haunted house from FNAF 3. Her heart started to pound in excitement and fear. Was she dreaming? She had to be, right? Before she could think what to do next, the small boy she'd seen in her room appeared in front of her. She recognised his red shirt, jeans and blue sneakers. Up close, she could see that his brown hair was sort of spiky and must. His dark eyes looked empty. Hi, she said, unsure of how to start. I'm Mandy. You've been visiting me, haven't you? What's your name? The ghost didn't respond. He just stared at her in a despondent way. Weird meeting you here, huh? Mandy glanced around, wondering how she could get out of here, when she was pretty sure here didn't exist in the real world. Why do you think we're here? She rubbed her arms, trying to get warm, and her teeth started to chatter. Do you know the way out? She stepped toward the little boy, but in a flash, he spun around to run. Oh, snap. Wait, stop! Mandy took off after him down the hallway from which she spent countless hours fending off animatronics. Her feet slapped against the hard floor. It's not safe here. There are things that want to hurt you. Man, the kid was quick. He turned corners and ran through rooms too fast for her to keep up. Stop, come back. She saw a flash of his red shirt as he sped into a room. She shoved through the door after him, but when she looked around, she couldn't find him. She was in some sort of storage room. Shelves lined every wall, all filled with animatronic parts. There was a bear head, a small box of eyes and arm and legs. Hey, come out, please, she whispered, although she wasn't sure why. A big box was set off to the side. She looked behind it, and there he was, sitting down, his legs pulled to his chest and his face tucked to his knees. He was hiding, poor little guy. Hey, don't be scared. I'm not going to hurt you. She got down on her knees in front of him. He lifted his head and a chill skittered down her spine. In the yellow lighting, his eyes were so dark, it was as if empty pits stared back at her. Uh, it's okay to be scared. We can get out of here together. Come on, take my hand. She reached out her hand, but the boy didn't move to take it. Please, I can help you. What's your name, anyway? She moved closer, 
her knees scraping against the floor as she reached out to him. She hesitated when a strangled growl echoed in the room. What is that? She whispered. A wave of fear and adrenaline washed over her. She peeked over her shoulder expecting to see a freaky animatronic and exhaled when nothing was there. She turned back toward the boy and he sprang at her, his mouth gaping wide, his teeth huge and sharp. Mandy screamed as, he, as she jerked upright in her bed. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, she whispered as her pulse fluttered erratically. She searched around her dark bedroom. She was at home. She was okay. Just a bad dream. A bad, bad dream. It's over now. She licked her dry lips as her pulse began to settle. She grabbed Mr. Happy and tucked him under her arm as she rested her head back on the pillow, but her eyes lingered on her locked bedroom door. The next day at school, Mandy was nervous returning to Donovan Prep. She wouldn't meet anyone else's eyes. Uh, yeah, she wouldn't meet anyone's eyes as she walked to her locker. Usually she held her head high as she walked the halls, but today she just didn't have it in her. She could sense other girls looking at her, whispering behind her back. It made her want to hunch over in mortification and shame. The freak show, who really had become the entertainment of the week. After the strange dream last night, she hadn't been able to go back to sleep and she just tossed and turned until breakfast. Now she felt a little like a zombie that everyone couldn't help to stare at with shocked amazement. She passed by Melissa and Lily in the hall and they burst out in laughter and all the pain she felt yesterday came tumbling back to her. She clenched her, fists into, her hands into her fists. It doesn't matter, she told herself. I just need to get through this day. When she got to her locker, she spun the combo and slowly opened the door to make sure there were no hidden surprises. A few girls giggled at that. To Mandy's relief, everything was normal and nothing puked at her face. She just had to put in some of the newly cleaned books she'd taken home with her the next day, the day before. Her phone vibrated with a message from a number she didn't recognise. When she clicked on the message, a boomerang photo of herself appeared with green goop launching at her face with, from the locker. It was like watching her own nightmare on replay over and over again. Mandy clenched her jaw and deleted the message, blocking the unknown number. Then, with her head down, she slammed her locker closed and rushed to her first class. At lunch, she found the tree she always sat under. She started messaging with Lindy. Do you believe in ghosts? Yeah, kinda. But I've never seen one, have you? I think I did last night. Then I dreamt of him. Him? A little boy who doesn't talk and just stares at me. Wow, that is creepy. Totally. Mandy typed, why do ghosts haunt, into a search engine on her phone. She clicked on a couple of website links and articles that appeared. Unfinished business? With me? Not that I know of. They have a message to tell you. Okay, what kind of message? They don't know they're dead? Hmm. I sure don't want to be the one to tell him after the gaping mouth scare. Basically, she was still at a loss as to why the ghost kept appearing to her. When it was time for study period with Melissa and Lily, Mandy kept her head down while doing her homework. As usual, the girls struck up one of their fascinating conversations. May said, I mean, Mandy, I just loved the purple, Melissa said quietly from behind her. Mentally, Mandy rolled her eyes, bouncing her knee underneath her desk. What's the matter, Mandy? You didn't care for the green? Lily piped in. We could have called you Watermelon Head. Mandy remained quiet. Oh no, Mandy's not talking to us, Lily. I think we hurt her little feelings. What's the matter, Mandy? You're too good to, tell, to talk to us now you have purple hair. Maybe we broke her, Lily, Melissa said, barely holding back laughter. Oh, that's perfect. Mandy didn't respond. Couldn't. She acted as if they weren't even there. The truth was, she hated confrontation, and yesterday she'd been hurt in a way she couldn't soon forget. She felt like a punching bag, bruised and beat up, but she was beginning to realise that letting them know that they had defeated her hurt even more. She felt she was at some kind of emotional crossroads. She could stand up for herself by acting like they d the, what they'd done didn't bother her, or she could sulk away, defeated and broken. Usually, she'd go with the first option, but she no longer had the willpower to make that choice, so the sulky, defeated and broken Mandy would have to suffice for now. Finally, she got through the study period and made it home without any further incident. Diving back into the FNAF mystery photo was just what she w needed to forget all the drama at school. She had learnt to take the things that didn't make her happy and put them away in small imaginary boxes, hidden away from her daily life so that they wouldn't hurt her anymore. It was a strategy that worked, and she was sticking to it. It took some time going through pages of search engine links for the mystery building, but Mandy finally discovered a website that gave her a clue to the 
odd looks haunted now.jpg image. Within a city website for a small town called Peace Valley, there was a picture of a similar looking building in colour. Wait, Peace Valley? That wasn't the place in Fetch, was it? I don't think it was. It can't have been. I'll have to look that up later. I don't think it was. This has to be it, she murmured. She pulled up the original photo and compared it to the size and style of the old buildings, right down to the colour of the chipped door. Yes, this is it. Now, where's Peace Valley located? She clicked on a location link. This building was indeed real, located in Utah. Oh, never mind. And the address was on Willow Field Road. Mandy leaped from her chair, pumped her fist in there and danced around her bedroom singing. She couldn't believe she actually found it. She grabbed Bobby's photo. I did it, Bobby. I located the real building. She spun around until she was dizzy and fell onto her bed, breathing hard as her bedroom spun. I have to tell Lindy. She sat up and sent a quick message to Lindy that she'd found the real location of the building, followed by a line of happy-faced emojis. Then she sprung out of bed and map-searched the actual address. The location came up as a movie, movie theatre called Old Cinemas that played silent films. Mandy nodded. How cool would it be to go to an old theatre and watch a silent film? Maybe something scary like a Lon Chaney flick. I don't know what that is. Uh, Mandy's phone rang with a video call from Lindy, which Mandy answered with a scream. Ah! Lindy seemed to drop the phone, but then she picked it up and her face reappeared. Sheesh, what's the matter? I found the building. It's an old-timey movie theatre in Utah. Lindy's eyes went big. I live in Utah. Mandy's mouth dropped open, then split into a grin. I totally forgot. This is getting better and better. She spun around and then put the phone in front of her face. Okay, okay, let's get serious here. Why would a photo of an old cinema house titled Looks Haunted Now be hidden within the files of FNAF 3 and would then, when discovered, be completely removed? Lindy nodded, her expression very intrigued. I smell a conspiracy. Exactly, and I'm going to solve it. Lindy lifted her eyebrows. Hey, I just noticed your hair is purple. It's so you. Here are the facts. <laughs> Number one. After decompiling FNAF 3, I discovered an anomaly within the game images. It was a colourless photo of a mysterious building. The image was called Looks Haunted Now.jpg. I posted... Sorry, number two. <laughs> I posted this discovered photo on the forum, and the next day, poof, it was gone from the game files. Erased. Number three. I reverse image searched the photo. Sounds cool when I say it like that. And discovered the building is located in a particular state. This building is of an old movie house. I can't share the old all my secret facts yet until I solve this game theory. <laughs> but hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Stay tuned for more. Eminem. Purple, Mandy. Really? Mandy froze at her computer screen, then smiled. Her mother was standing in her bedroom doorway. Her mum's black hair was styled in an elegant flip. Her black suit fit her slim frame perfectly, and she was even wearing the power heels to match. Ooh. <laughs> Mama, hi. Doesn't this colour make you think of grape juice? She asked her. You remember how much I used to love that stuff. That isn't what comes to mind. No. Mum sighed and walked to her, bending down to give her a quick hug. Truthfully, I think of eggplant. <laughs> Mandy took in her subtle perfume. It always brought Mandy comfort. Really? How was your flight? Tiring, but it's good to be home for a couple of days before I head out on Monday. Mum glanced over at Bobby's picture next to Mandy's laptop and ran a finger over Bobby's little face. She blinked and straightened. <coughs> <coughs> oh, that was a really weird sneeze. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I need a shower. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Mandy nodded. Where are you off to on Monday again? Utah, yeah. Uh, Mum turned and walked toward the hallway. Oh my gosh, it's the word that I can never remember how to pronounce. Oh, it's a type of tree. It's cedar, or cedar, or cedar, or cedar. <laughs> cedar City. <laughs> That's wrong, isn't it? Um, it's in Utah, Mandy finished. Yep, Mum called over her shoulder as she walked away. Dinner in an hour. Mandy's eyes widened and she smiled. Oh, snap. This was absolutely perfect. Lindy was from this city. She could meet Lindy, and maybe the two of them could actually visit the mystery building in real life to see if there were any clues to the connection to FNAF 3. 
Excited, she stood and started to pace around her room. Now the only question was, how was she going to convince her mum to take her along? An hour later, Mandy strolled into the kitchen. When mum was home, there was actual fresh food for dinner. No frozen food or ordering out. Mum loved to cook. Mandy sniffed at the air when she walked in the kitchen. Definitely pasta. She could smell the mouth-watering artichoke, marinara and boiling noodles. Oh, and the homemade garlic bread. Yum. Thank you, Mum. Mum was dressed in sweats and a sweater. Her face bare of makeup, her hair wound up in a small bun. She smiled as she chopped vegetables for a salad. She was going ham on the veggies, chopping with the cool precision and speed of a sous chef. Uh, it was amazing how she did that. Mandy wondered often if there was anything her mum couldn't do. I know you don't have enough freshly cooked meals when I'm away. Mum paused for a moment. Maybe we should hire a cook when I'm gone. No, that would be weird. Dad's harshly home for dinners anyway. But you are. That's not important. <laughs> mum met her eyes. Mandy, don't say that. Everything about you is important. Mandy's chest tingled a little at her words as she watched her mum finish cutting up the vegetables. Mum... Turns out I'm doing research on a historical building in a small town in Utah. And since you're going to the city, I was wondering... Mum shook her head. Mandy, I'm sorry, but Utah's a big state. True. I don't know if I'll have time to go where you need me to do what you need me to do. I do have an assistant, though. Maybe I can bribe her to help us out. She loves chocolate truffles. Mandy laced her fingers together. No, I mean, can I go with you? Mum paused, her mouth dropping open. And miss school? Mandy nodded. How long is your trip? Three days. I can email I can email all my teachers. They'll send me all the homework. Please, Mum, it's important to me. Mandy watched her mother stir the pasta and then the mari marinara. I keep wanting to say Mariana, as in the Mariana Trench. Deep in thought. Nervous, Mandy twirled a stray lock of hair around her finger. And you know my good friend Lindy? I introduced you on the video call last month. She lives in the city and <laughs> I might actually get to meet her in person for the first time. When will I ever have another chance like that? And you're always saying don't let good opportunities pass you by. Take them as they come before they disappear for good. Mum smiled. Okay, okay, okay. I'm glad you actually listened to me. I was thinking I probably wouldn't get be able to spend much time with you because my entire trip is booked solid with work. Perfect. Excuse me? I mean, it's okay. I'll be busy with research and hanging out with Lindy. I thought I would never get to meet her. She's like my closest friend. Don't you have close friends at school? Mandy crossed her arms, realising she'd almost tipped her hand. Um, yeah, but Lindy and I just click. Mum frowned as if she was trying to remember when Mandy last had a friend over to the house. How come you haven't invited anyone over in a while? Mandy lifted her eyebrows. In a while? Try three years. Mum finally gave up. Okay, if that's important, but... Oh, sorry, okay, if it's that important, but you be sure to get all your makeup work ahead of time. And we, and you're going to complete it by the time we get back. Mandy bounced up on her toes. Yes, thank you, Mum, you're the best. She hugged her and sped out of the room to call Lindy. Mandy was sort of bummed she didn't get a window seat on the plane, but she was mostly just excited to be on her way to Utah to meet Lindy in person for the first time and to get a chance at seeing the mystery building. Mum was next to her, doing her best to work on her laptop with minimal elbow space. There was a crying baby on board, and Mandy was following the cues of those around her, putting earplugs in her ears. It had been some time since Mandy had been on a flight. When she was little, there was a lot more family vacation travel with both of her parents, but somewhere in the past five years or so, vacations became few and far between. With every new promotion, her parents' jobs had, been, had become more demanding, giving them a bigger workload and less time for the family. Mandy had a perfect view down the airplane aisle, giving her easy access to people watching. Across from her was an older woman with white hair, wearing glasses. She had a blanket on her lap as she read a book, a tattered old murder mystery. In front of her seat sat a man in a business suit, checking email on a tablet. Behind the older woman, a man in a hoodie, shorts and headphones bopped his head to the music. It made Mandy smile. A flight attendant passed by, and Mandy shifted to see down the long aisle. She saw a little boy kicking out his foot. He wore an uncomfortably familiar blue sneaker. Unease shifted inside her as she moved back to her headrest. 
Just a coincidence to see the same little blue shoes, right? It couldn't be a ghost. Taking a breath, she peeked out again, but the little shoe was no longer kicking it out into the aisle. Mandy settled back into her seat and closed her eyes. Little boy, someone called out. Mandy's eyes whipped open. She stuck her head out into the aisle again. There was a little boy running in the opposite direction of Mandy. He had brown hair, a red shirt, jeans and blue shoes. Mandy flashed cold. No, this wasn't a dream. She was wide awake, right? She pinched herself and it hurt. Just to be sure, she reached over and pinched her mom. Mandy, sorry, just checking if this is a dream. <laughs> imagine that. Imagine having that interaction with someone. I might do that. I'm, oh, I'm going to do that later. <laughs> I'm going to do that to someone later. Um, Mum frowned and shook her head. With the baby constantly crying, it's actually kind of a nightmare. Luckily, it's a short flight. Little boy, return to your seat, please. The flight attendant called out, passing by Mandy and going after the runaway boy. Mandy craned her neck, trying to see the boy's face. The flight attendant caught up with the kid. She took his hand and turned to lead him back to his seat. Mandy still couldn't see what he looked like. Lady, move already, she whispered. Mandy, what are you doing? Mum asked her. Just trying to see something, Mandy murmured. Unfortunately, the flight attendant continued to block her view as she sat the boy back in his seat. Once he was seated, the little blue shoe kicked out in the aisle again. Mandy couldn't wait any longer. She pushed up from her seat, ignoring her mum, calling after her. Uh, she walked quickly to the boy and stopped beside his seat. A little boy with blue eyes stared up at her. He wore a red shirt with a big red dog. He had freckles on his face and a brown birthmark on his chin. It was just a kid, not the ghost. Her shoulders sagged in relief. Can I help you? A frazzled woman asked, sitting beside the boy. She was trying to settle her crying baby by patting his back. Oh, um, no, sorry, I thought I saw someone I knew. My mistake. Miss, you'll have to return to your seat, please, the, the flight attendant told Mandy. Mandy turned and smiled. Yes, I'm sorry. She squeezed past the attendant to walk back to her seat. At the far end of the aisle, Mandy felt a fresh wave of adrenaline as she saw a familiar flash of red while, ta while taking her seat. Wow, Mum's hotel suite was pretty swanky. <laughs> there were two bedrooms, two baths, a lounge area and small kitchenette. Elegant maroon and grey designs were spread across the suite, from the hanging wall art down to the pillows and lamps. A basket of fruit and nuts waited for them on the small table. You always stay in places like this, Mum? Mandy asked her. Sometimes, most times they're bigger. She set her purse and briefcase down and motioned to the bellboy. Just set the luggage by the door, please, she tipped him, and the man left. I'm sorry to drop you off and run, but I have a lunch meeting scheduled. I wasn't planning on having a travelling companion this time round. Mandy waved a hand. It's okay, Mum. I told you. I'm doing research. Yes, for a project. What kind of project is this, again? No big deal. Just the history of a historic silent movie theatre. It's about 20 minutes away in a town called Peace Valley. Small town, only about 320 residents. Oh, okay. Mum's phone rang, and she answered, then called out to Mandy. Order your lunch. I'll check in with you later. Love you. She scooped up her purse and briefcase and marched out the door, giving orders to someone on the phone. Mandy just waved at her retreating back. She walked to the large window and gazed at the distant mountains of Utah. The sun shined down from a clear blue sky. Peaceful, she thought. She went to her backpack and pulled out Bobby's framed photo. She faced him toward the view. Really nice, huh, Bobby? She set him down on the small table and dialed Lindy for a video chat. Lindy's happy face appeared on screen. You're here? Oh, sorry, you're here? <laughs> that was wrong intonation. Mandy flung out an arm dramatically. Yes, Utah, here I am. Lindy squealed. Ah, this is so cool. We're finally in the same state. <laughs> I know. How was the flight? I've never been anywhere else. It was good. A little bumpy for a minute. Uh, and my ears popped as we landed. Always happens. When can we meet up? Lindy sighed, pushing up her glasses. Not until tomorrow. I have to take my brother to a little league practice because both my parents are busy today and my older brother has to work. But right after school, I'll meet you at your hotel. I mapped out the address and I'm only 15 minutes away on the highway. Sounds awesome. I'm going to do some research at the town records on old cinemas and see if anything interesting pops up. Sounds fun. Wish I could be there too. 
No worries, we'll be there together tomorrow. After they disconnected, Mandy grabbed Bobby's photo and slipped it inside her backpack. She pulled out a package of licorice and hooked her backpack onto her back. She'd searched the city website for bus information and the city hall location. It took her half a, a half hour on the city bus to get to the local recorder's office at City Hall, where she could research more on the history of the mystery building. Peace Valley was so small, it didn't have its own city hall or even a police station. Luckily, Mandy had the town's information right at her fingertips in the recorder's office. According to the, re the records, um, old cinemas used to be another business over 17 years ago called Sideshow Snacks Shack. What? Oh no, never mind. Never mind. Oh my gosh. That terrified me for a second. Because if that was snack space, that would have mind that would have meant this is in the same universe as Into the Pit and Room for One More. And Security Breach, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> From there, Mandy researched any information in the city records to tell her about the old eatery. The business lasted for about three years, but foreclosed 17 years ago. Next, she researched the old newspaper records for anything regarding Sideshow Snack Shack. She skimmed the papers for the first year of the business and found the grand opening announcement with the headline, Grand Opening! Sideshow Snack Shack! A family food and fun! <laughs> She skimmed the following years for any news on the business. A headline caught Mandy's interest. Young boy presumed kidnapped at Sideshow Snack Shack. The date seemed to be a few weeks before the diner closed its doors for good. Ah, so this is like an inspiration for the FNAF, because uh, there's a missing child at the Sideshow, Sideshow Snack Shack, and therefore they use the location, blah blah blah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the date seems to be a few weeks before the diner closed its doors for good. The article stated a five-year-old boy went missing at the eatery one Friday afternoon. One moment, the boy was playing a pinball machine, and the next moment, he just disappeared. The mother as well as the staff searched frantically for the boy before the police arrived. Once the police began questioning the customers, frantic accounts were given of a mysterious man having been near the boy before the disappearance. Wow, Mandy murmured. She glanced at the copy of the man's... Featureless sketch, dark eyes and hair, straight nose, flat mouth. The man was just so ordinary. For some reason, the paper sketch of the suspect had been printed hastily with purple ink, and they'd called him the Purple Man. Mandy whispered in amazement. She'd heard of a story very similar to this online somewhere. Where had she read about this? Then she remembered the thread on missing children in the FNAF forums. <laughs> on her phone, she logged back into the missing children thread skimming through the posts until she found the one about the missing boy and the purple man. The post did mention Utah and a family diner. All the other details were so vague that some of the comments stated they believed this missing boy story was fake, especially the point about the purple man. In a rush, Mandy made copies of the pertinent research to take everything back with her to the hotel. This mysterious building was turning into one interesting case. An old building, a missing boy, a family food diner and a purple man. It was perfect fodder for a FNAF fan fiction piece. All that's missing is a possessed animatronic. That's true. Mandy stepped into a darkened room with rows of party tables set up. Party hats were lined up one by one on the tables like festive soldiers. The air was cold and when she blew out, a white mist floated in the air and disappeared. Freddy's. She breathed as she walked down the rows of tables in amazement. To one side of the room was the animatronic show, just like in the game she played. She glanced up at the wall and spotted the surveillance camera. Just because she could, she waved. But then, when she saw her arm covered in a dark shirt, she looked down at herself. She wore a dark, button-down shirt, slacks and boots. Manny's eyes widened in disbelief. She was dressed like a security guard from the games. The next moment, she whirled around, her heart pounding. Had she heard a scrape of a shoe? Or had someone moved something? She searched the shadows for something creepy, but saw only empty darkness. A whisper of unease passed through her. Pulse, fu f eh, pulse fluttering, she started to walk fast out of the party room, glancing over her shoulder. She had this feeling like she was being watched, like something very bad lurked just behind, ready to jump at her. When she got to the doorway of the room, she stopped abruptly. 
The ghost stood in front of her, in his red shirt and blue jeans. This time she noticed a character on his shirt, some kind of a bear logo. The boy looked sad, but she wasn't certain he was just an innocent, lost little boy anymore. She was scared to get close to him after what happened in her last dream. His skin seemed paler here, his cheeks sunken in, and there were dark circles rimming his eyes. His hair appeared limp and greasy. Um, hey there, Mandy said to him. So, how do we get out of this dream? The ghost hissed and flashed a mouth full of sharp teeth. Mandy stumbled back, knowing there was only one way out of the room. She rushed past the ghost as the familiar growing, growling began. He reached for her, his hands slashing through air, and she darted across the black and white checkered floors. She ran through the arcade, passed by the restrooms, and found a door to a room with a sign that said employees only. She kept looking behind her, though she couldn't see the ghost. She still had a feeling he was there, always there, just currently somewhere she couldn't see him. She pushed through the door, her heart racing, and slammed it shut. When she turned, she screamed. The ghost stood in the room, his dark, empty eyes glaring at her. She pushed up against the door as if she could crawl through the wood. What do you want? She yelled at him. Just leave me alone. He took a step toward her, and her stomach curled. Stay away from me. He jumped on her, his face morphing into something ghoulish, eyebrows slanted, teeth somehow bigger and sharper, and she screamed as he tore at her with his hands. Scratches burned into her skin. She tried to push at him. She shoved her hand to his neck and recoiled when her hand caved into corroded flesh. Help me! Mandy screamed. Mandy, wake up, Mandy! Mandy sucked in air and opened her eyes to find her mum looming over her. Her mum's hair was dishevelled. <laughs> her expression scared. Mandy blew out. Mum, it was just a bad dream, sweetie. Are you okay? Mandy swallowed hard and nodded. Her nightshirt was damp against her skin, blankets twisted around her body. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. What on earth were you dreaming about? It was about a ghost. He was chasing me, and this time he'd caught her. Mom sighed. Really? Why was he chasing you? I don't know. He wouldn't talk. Creeps me out, Mom. A shudder ran through her. Mom ran a hand over her hair. Okay, well, it's all over now. You're safe. You sure this doesn't have to do with all those scary games you play online? Mandy wasn't so sure, but she shook her head anyway. Well, try to go back to sleep. I think the ghost has bothered you enough for the night. You sure you're okay? Mandy nodded and smiled. Yeah, thanks. Mum kissed her forehead and walked to her room. Mandy settled back against her pillow, but when she looked at the dark doorway, her mum had just walked through. The ghost was standing there, fear smacked in Mandy's chest. She scrambled out from her covers, crawling into a ball at the headboard. When she blinked, he was gone. Trembling, Mandy stood on the bed, looking at every darkened corner of the room. Her heart was racing, but she didn't see him. She quickly turned on the side table light. Uh, sorry, she quickly turned on the side table light to ensure she was alone. No little nightmare lurking around. What do you want with me, ghost boy? She asked the empty room. And why won't you leave me alone? Manny tried to fall back asleep, but it wasn't happening. Just after two in the morning, she crept into her mum's room and crawled into bed with her. Mandy couldn't remember the last time she spent the night in her parents' room, but cuddling in close, she felt safe. She felt safe for the first time since this whole thing began. Mandy and Lindy spotted each other instantly in the lobby of the hotel. They ran toward each other and hugged, big smiles plastered on their faces. Mandy pulled back. This is so cool! <laughs> so cool. Lan <laughs> Lindy repeated, pushing her purple glasses up the bridge of her nose. And look at us, we're about the same height. Yeah, Lindy said with a laugh. You're just as I pictured you, with your leggings and big boots. Same here, Mandy told her. Come on, let's go up to the room and figure out our next move. <laughs> they went up the elevator discussing the latest FNAF fan fiction they'd loved as they headed to Mandy's hotel room. I like the ones with the animatronics are the good guys, and they crack jokes. Those are hilarious and entertaining, Lindy told her. Mandy agreed. Those are good ones. Wow, this is big, Lindy said in awe as she stepped inside the hotel suite. Yeah, I know. Nice, right? This is the first time I went with my mum on a business trip. Here, have some fruit. Or do you like licorice? I'll take an apple, thanks. The girls sat down at the small table, and Mandy updated Lindy on yesterday's findings about the movie theatre, the old eatery, and the missing boy. Wow, you're really good at this kind of thing. 
I wouldn't have known where to start with these records. You should be a detective or a reporter. Thanks. I haven't decided what I want to do yet. What about you? I'm leaning toward marine biology. <laughs> there's this there's this cool place. Uh, there's this pizzeria I'm looking at. Uh, it's with like there's this Felix the Shark thing. There's also sea bunnies in there. That's cool. You should visit California. We have some awesome beaches. I want so I want to so bad. People think I'm weird when I talk about the ocean life. They call me fish nerd at school. They call me freak show at mine. They laughed together. Mandy found it funny how small uh, and petty the DP drama felt from this distance. There was some hope out there, having met Lindy, but maybe things wouldn't suck forever. Mandy reached for her licorice as she, beat, as she booted up her laptop. Anyway, I'm thinking the disappearance of the boy in this story could somehow be connected to Five Nights at Freddy's law. Because of the missing kids theme, Mandy tugged off a bite of licorice. I know it's a long shot, but I'm willing to try to find out. What's the next step? Are we heading to Peace Valley to see for ourselves? Yep. It's been a long time, but you never know what might still be there. Lindy grinned. I was hoping you'd say that. A short drive later, Mandy and Lindy cruised through Peace Valley. The sidewalks were small and the businesses a little outdated. Mandy didn't recognise any big chain stores. She noticed a Harold's hardware store and a Sally's groceries. A post office sat on a corner and a town's single, single streetlight was in the middle of the town. By the gas station. Wow, a single streetlight. That's funny. The mountains around the town were amazing and she couldn't seem to get enough of them. The road signs mentioned a river not far off and she wished selfishly that she was here purely as a tourist. She would have loved to check it out while she was here. Lindy pulled into the small parking lot behind old cinemas. The day was warm as they walked around the old building. Stopped in front of the door, Mandy sighed. Here goes nothing, she said. Lindy smiled in response, grabbing the door handle. Together they walked through the front door of the silent movie theatre. For some reason, Mandy felt a little lightheaded and her palms went damp. All this research and she was finally seeing the mysterious building in real life. She didn't know what she would do if all of this was for nothing. If the photo in the game files turned out to be a fluke or an error. It couldn't be for nothing. It couldn't be. This is pretty amazing, she said. Lindy nodded. Yeah, it's the most exciting thing I've done in a while. Same here. They walked in to see a cheap plastic card table set up for ticket sales. The carpet was red with some rips in the flooring. Old posters of black and white silent films were pinned to the walls. There was popcorn, candy and soda cans for sale at another counter. An older woman with satin flowers in her hair sat at the ticket sales table. For two, her voice sounded raspy. She wore a faded apron with old cinemas printed on it. Mandy and Lindy looked at each other and smiled. Yes, please, Mandy said. They exchanged money for tickets, uh, and then they jumped for tickets uh, for the silent film of the day. As they walked toward the cinema room, Mandy noticed a maintenance man working on some kind of electrical box embedded in the wall. Hey Marge, he called out. Gonna have to buy a fuse. What's the matter? The older woman asked. The flights in the theatre keep flickering. All right, Jim, do what you gotta do. Damn thing hasn't been reliable in 20 years. Guess some things never change. Mandy put her hand to Lindy's shoulder to stop her. She turned around and walked back to the maintenance man. Excuse me, sir. You've worked here for 20 years? Surprised, the man lifted his bushy eyebrows as his eyes were drawn to Mandy's purple hair. Yeah, got a problem with that? A man's got to make a living somehow. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't have a problem with that, sir. Um, yes, you have to make a living, totally. Mandy looked at Lindy and then winced, then turned back to the man named Jim. I was just wondering if you worked here when it was the previous business, when it was called Chi Sideshow Snack Shack. The man gave a nod. Oh yeah, that was a fun time back then. Lots of families, lots of business. Shame it closed its doors. Why do you think it did close its doors? He scratched his neck. Well, there was an incident, and then after that, not much business. Do you mean the incident was the missing boy? Jim squinted at Mandy. Why you want to know, kid? I'm researching this building and read an article about five missing uh, about a missing five-year-old boy. Jim tossed his tools in a bag and wiped his hands with a dirty towel. Yeah, that was the only bad time I recall. After he went missing, families got scared and the business went downhill. Not much you can do to change people's minds after a tragedy, you know. Were you there that day? The day he went missing? Oh yeah, I even helped with the police search. He struggled his thick shoulders. 
But we never found him. Crushed the poor mother's heart. Crushed a lot of the hearts that day. Can I buy you a soda and you can tell us more about it? Jim pulled at his ear, thinking. Research, you said. Mandy nodded. Yes. What for? <laughs> I'm a blogger. Jim nodded. Ah, one of those daily type things online. Time's sure I've changed. Um, yeah, kinda. I guess. I got a break coming up. I could use an orange soda. Mandy bought them all sodas, and they sat at a table by the concession counter. Jim took a long swig of his soda. Guess I should tell you about the boy. Always came in with his mum, nearly every day. They'd order hot dogs and lemonade, because that was the kid's favourite. We had a couple of pinball games back then, and he'd play and pray. The mother would say hello to everyone. Real fam, real, real nice family, you know. We gotta serve them as regulars. Kid's name was Stevie, but when it's time to go, he never wanted to leave, and he would hide from his mother. She'd have to go all over the building and look for him. Sometimes he was under the corner table or in the bathroom. One time he snuck into the kitchen and hid it behind a garbage can. Clever, Lindy said. Jim nodded and sipped his soda. That he was. Feisty is what I call it. Sometimes I'll help the mom and track him out. Oh, someone might be under the pinball machine. <laughs> then she'd find him and tickle him. That kind of thing. And the day he went missing? Mandy asked. Uh, yeah, Jim said. Sad. Pretty regular day starting off. They ordered their usual and ate. He played games for a couple of hours. Then his mom called for him. That it was time to go. She started poking around his usual hideouts. Then she came and got me for help. Couldn't help him though. Then we started to get real nervous. Looked everywhere. Poor kid was just gone. Called the police then. Um, what about the purple man? Did you see him? You mean the stranger? Jim shook his head. Nobody I saw that was suspicious. So, uh, sure. Sometimes we got new people I hadn't met before. Some of the customers started telling the police about a guy they saw, they saw, they swore they saw. And they all had different descriptions of the guy. I never knew who they were talking about. Nothing came of it. I think everyone was just scared. We lived in a small, quiet town. Everyone feels safe here. Then something like this happens and they wonder if they really are safe. But someone had to take Stevie, right? Mandy asked. He couldn't just have disappeared. He sighed. Yeah, he couldn't have just disappeared. Mandy and Lindy left without watching the movie because Lindy had to get home. That's sad, Lindy said as they walked to the car. Yeah, real sad. Mandy's mind was zipping through all the information. Do you see some of the similarities of this incident to Five Nights at Freddy's? Lindy shook her head. Not really. We have a missing boy and a purple man. Get it? Like William Afton, the purple guy? I guess so. That's only two small things. Mandy paused at Lindy's sedan. But you do see it, right? This must be the reason the photo is in the game files and why it got deleted the next day. The creator of the games was leading us here to solve something. We just need to figure out what so we can set the forum straight. Lindy stared at Mandy a moment. Are you okay? Mandy gave a nod. Of course. Why? Just seems this is really important to you. You know, it's a big thing to prove and it's okay if you can't. It wouldn't be the end of the world. Mandy tugged at a loose strand of her hair. To her, it would be the end of the world. The forums, the fan community, they were really the only things she looked forward to being a part of. She'd found Lindy through those message boards. If she didn't have them, then Melissa was right. She was just DP's freak show. Then I'm going to prove it. Mandy swallowed hard. She had to. I mean, it would be cool, right? If I connected it to FNAF. Lindy nodded. So cool. But just remember, these are real people. Not a game. Promise you'll be careful. Mandy smiled. Promise. M and M scoop entry number 220. Guys, I visited the old building that I discovered in the FNAF 3 files. I walked inside and learned of an unsolved mystery, an old unsolved mystery. It was fantastic. I mean, to think I actually visited a place that could be connected somehow to the FNAF game lore. I know, you probably want me to spill already, right? Well, I can't. I'm still piecing together information. This time, I want to have solid evidence before sharing everything I've learnt. I just want you to know that this investigation is so awesome and surreal. I love the FNAF universe. Eminem. <laughs> I keep saying like Eminem, like the rapper. 
Mom Spaghetti. Uh, oh, God. I forgot his accent. Oh, no. Uh, you're back again. Nope, that's Scottish. <laughs> you're back again, Jim, the maintenance man at Old Cinemas, said to Mandy as she walked through the hallway. It had taken her a good hour on the bus to get there, but it had been worth it to visit Old Cinemas again. She had one more day in Utah, and she was going to make good use of it, starting by comparing old photos she found on a website to the current layout of the movie theatre. Yep, trying to see the difference between sideshows and how the movie theatre is today, she waved her phone in the air. You're pretty dedicated, I'll give you that. Jim scratched his head. Yeah, there are a few rooms that we used then that are now closed off. Really? Like, which ones? The party room. Oh god, that's... <laughs> that is not the accent. The party room is now the storage room for some of the old stuff. Excitement shot through Mandy. Wow, can I see it? Well, I don't know. The owner didn't know if he wanted to throw it all away, and then he just stored it. But it's been sitting there ever since. Oh please, this would be so cool for the blog. Jim shrugged. Guess it'll be okay. But don't be touching anything. I can't have you getting hurt because then I'd be in trouble. Liability and all that. Mandy crossed her chunky black boots. Promise. All right. Oh, hello, Mrs. Robbins. <laughs> Jim practically bowed his head in greeting. The woman smiled. Her hair was brown with grey streaks, her face slightly lined. She clutched her purse to her side, and there was something about her that seemed really unhappy. For some reason, Mandy suddenly felt the same feeling in the centre of her chest. It was familiar to her. She felt it many times alone at home, a feeling of emptiness and ultimate sadness, a feeling that Mandy sometimes thought would never go away. Hello, Jim. Good to see you today, the woman said. You too. Enjoy the show. The woman walked into the cinema room. That's Mrs. Robbins, Jim said when she was out of his earshot. Uh, Mandy noticed... Ab uh, sorry, Na Mandy nodded absently. That's the mother. Mandy's eyes nearly popped out of her head. Stevie's mother? For real? Shh. She comes here a couple of times a week, ever since old cinemas opened. One of the nicest ladies you'll ever meet. But you leave her alone, yeah? Poor woman's been through enough. Come on, I'll show you the storage room. Mandy followed Jim down the hallway, focusing her thoughts on Mrs. Robbins. Jim had said Stevie's mum had brought him to sideshows every, nearly every day. And now she visits old cinemas in remembrance of her missing son. How sad was that? Jim halted and fished out the key from his keyring. He unlocked and pushed open the door, then turned on the light. The light only lit the centre of the room. Some of the other lights were apparently burned out. The windows were lined with old newspapers, and there were stacks of boxes and old tables and chairs. Be careful, I'll just be down the hall. Thank you. When Jim left, Mandy took out Bobby's framed photo. She hooked the small photo stand on the zipper of her sweatshirt. There, so you can have a good view of all this amazing stuff with me. Mandy stepped through rows of boxes and packages. A musty smell tingled her nose and she sneezed. Against the far wall, she discovered a large, old yellow sign. Sideshow sa side Snack Shack was printed in bold letters, and a plain brown bear waved his hand. Mandy snapped a photo of it. There were boxes with party hats and unused balloons with Sideshow printed on them. Rolled up posters were propped in one corner. She found dusty takeout bags with the bear printed on them. A frayed grand opening banner was dropped in the centre of the room. The idea that Five Nights at Freddy's could be based on this real-life life event, Bobby, is super epic. I mean, I really feel bad for the little boy and Mrs. Robbins, though. She had a real sense of sadness to her. Sometimes when I miss you, I feel sad like that. Mandy turned in a circle and flinched in surprise. A shadowed form was lurking in a far darkened corner. Sheesh, what was that? Mandy stepped closer, peering into the dark. Her pulse sped up because whatever was in the corner made her feel uneasy. Um... I know we should see what that is, but something tells me I really don't want to. Mandy picked her way carefully to the corner of the room and the shape resolved into that... <coughs> Sorry, of a bear. Her previous thought came flooding back to her. All that's missing is the possessed animatronic. She jumped up in excitement and Bobby's picture fell to the floor. Oh shoot. She picked Bobby up and hooked the frame stand into her front, front pants pocket. Sorry about that. She walked a little closer and took some photos of the old bear. Dust lined his flat brown fur that seemed to sag on the frame of the body. The bear's ears drooped and one eye was closed while the other stayed open. The mouth was sewn shut. How cool is this? She murmured. She peered closer to the bear. 
and something awful filled her nostrils. A strange feeling of dread washed over her. Ooh, that's bad, real bad. A mouse skittered across the bear's face, and Mandy sprang back, waving a hand in front of her nose. I think this is our cue to go, Bobby. It stinks, and I don't like mice. She turned away and jolted when, she, when the ghost appeared. His skin was greyish now, dark circles cupping his black eyes. His cheekbones were so hollow, the outline of his skull formed sharp edges under his skin. Dark veins lined his face, like he was rotting within. His hair had thinned out, and she could see parts of his skull. Worse, he looked hungry, somehow. In this dark, cramped, terrifying place, Mandy felt the fear rise sharply within her. She could scream, but the props and boxes would likely dampen any sound. She felt the horror of her dreams could become a frightening reality at any moment. In a long-shot attempt, Mandy immediately closed her eyes, willing the ghost to disappear. But when she opened her eyes, he was still there. Fear catapulted through her body anew. No, she breathed. Mandy took off, around a stack of boxes, hoping to escape. But as she rounded the corner, he reappeared. It was like he was surrounding her. She swallowed hard and whirled back in the direction of the bear. Ghost Boy flashed in front of the bear, and this time he did disappear. Mandy slammed a hand to her beating heart to literally try to hold it in, since it felt like it wanted to pound right out of her chest. I think it's time we get out of here, Bobby, before he comes back. The ghost flashed again in front of the bear, and then a newspaper clipping floated off a box onto the ground. Mandy crouched and hesitantly picked it up. The clipping was about the missing boy, Stevie Robbins, and there was his picture. Mandy gasped. You are Stevie Robbins. She looked up at the bear again, but Stevie was gone. Mandy wasn't sure how long she sat in that storage room, trying to wrap her head around the fact that the little boy who'd been haunting her was the same missing boy from Sideshow Snack Shack. Can you believe this, Bobby? She swallowed hard. Why would he haunt me? If he wanted someone to solve the mystery of his disappearance, why not haunt a famous detective? Hey girl, you're still in there? Uh, seeing Jim in the doorway. Mandy sprang to her feet. Yeah, still here, just finishing up. I found some old newspaper cl clippings. Okay, well, hurry up. My shift is ending soon and I gotta lock up. Okay, will do, thanks. Manny turned back to the bear in the corner. Stevie flashed in front of the bear once again. What are you trying to tell me, Stevie? She closed her eyes, trying to backtrack through the dreams. Stevie was always running from her, hiding just like he hid from his mother when it was time to go home. He was always in the FNAF games. He was always attacking her, she shivered. And now he kept flashing in front of the bear, luring her. She opened her eyes to see Stevie appear in front of her. He climbed up in he climbed up the bear, turned its head, and then he disappeared. Mandy didn't want to go to the bear since it smelled really, really bad. She stepped closer, the smell getting stronger. Everything inside her told her to step away, to turn around and never come back. But she had to know what Stevie was trying to tell her. She had to solve the mystery and find the truth. Hesitantly, she stepped toward the bear, slapping a hand over her nose. Her stomach twisted and did a slow roll. She took a deep breath and held it as she used both hands to reach for the bear's head and twisted. The head clicked and a gear sounded, as if some inner device was unlocking. Mandy lifted the head slowly and set it down on a box. She pulled over a chair and climbed up, peering inside. It was too dark to see, but Mandy still saw more than she needed to see to put these pieces together. She clicked on her phone light, searching inside. She saw a little bit of brown hair and a top of a small skull and a patch of a bright red shirt. As she pieced together what she saw in her mind, terror gripped her entire body. She opened her mouth to scream, but nothing would come out. She jerked backward and fell off the chair, crashing to the floor. She couldn't scream. She couldn't breathe. She pushed to her feet and ran. You did it, girl. You found Stevie. Jim was saying to Mandy outside old cinemas where police scattered around the business. The day had turned overcast and Mandy started to shiver. All these years, he shook his head and waved his arm toward the movie house. I can't believe I never thought to check inside the bear. He was a hider. I should have checked any possible spot in the, li the little guy I could get into. After it was all over and the owner decided to close, we just sort of placed everything in the storage room and, locked and closed the doors. Never had to go inside. The snack shack was done. How'd you find him? What made you check inside the old slideshow? 
He looked at Mandy expectantly, but if she could impart some sage wisdom, uh, sorry, as if she could in impart some sage wisdom. But Mandy understood beneath his curiosity there was a layer of guilt. For years he'd been working around that building that the little dead boy was in, never realising the boy had been hidden there the entire time, just waiting for someone to find him. How could she tell him it was really all St Stevie's doing? That he'd led her, or scared her actually, into finding his body inside the old robotic bear. There still had to be DNA testing, but according to the size of the body and the clothes Stevie had seen, been last seen in, the investigator had told her they were pretty confident it was indeed Stevie Robbins, who'd been missing for 17 long years. Back in the present, Mandy cleared her throat, closing, uh, crossing her arms. I'm not sure. I was just sort of curious about how the bear worked, and that's how I found him. Jim scratched his head. Well, I gotta hand it to you, kid. You did a good thing. Real good, Mrs. Robbins and this town are going to have some peace and finally agree for little Stevie the right way. He looked at old cinemas and shook his head as he walked away. All these years. Mandy, I was so worried about you. Mandy's mum rushed to her. I'm sorry, mum. Mandy murmured against her as they hugged. Mum pulled back and rubbed her arms. How did this happen? You found a missing boy? Mandy swallowed so hard, trying not to cry. I found him inside the storage room. What were you doing looking inside the storage of this old place? It's a long story, Mum. I don't even know where to begin. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Is it okay for you to leave? I don't know. Did you already give a statement to the police? Mandy nodded. Okay, let me find out. Mum did her power walk toward a pa police officer who directed her to the lead investigator. Mum talked and the investigator nodded, writing down something in a small notebook. A few minutes later, Mum marched back to Mandy and told her and took her hand. Let's go to the hotel. You can tell me all about this over room service. What about work, Mom? I know you have a lot of meetings. I don't want to cause any problems for you. Work can be rescheduled. You're my daughter. You're my pro priority, sweetheart. As they started to leave, Mrs. Robbins caught them. She appeared uncertain, and there were tears on her cheeks. Her hands were fisted tightly around her purse strap, as if she might fall away if she let go. Hello, she said hesitantly. Are you Mandy? Hello, yes, this is Mandy, my daughter. Mum responded. Can we help you? I just wanted to say, Mrs. Robbins' voice cracked. My boy Stevie has been missing a long time. 17 years. Mum's face softened. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. It's been awful, the not knowing. I would think about him every day, miss him all the time. I would wish he was safe back at home with me. I think the day I lost him, I stopped living a bit. He she sniffed. These have been the loneliest years of my life. And to think, all the time he's being here, he, all this time he's been here, waiting, hiding like he used to. I always felt closer to him when I came here ev every week, and now I know why. Thank you so much for finally bringing my boy home to me. Thank you for bringing me peace. Mandy nodded, the knot in her throat growing so that she couldn't even swallow. She couldn't respond, so Mum did it for her. You're welcome. I'm glad he's finally home. Take care of yourself. Her mum guided Mandy to the car. A news reporter attempted to ask some questions, but mum was a pro and cut them off quickly. We'll call you later if we have a statement. We're just glad the boy was found. Thank you. Mandy and her mum got in the car and drove back to the hotel. That's when Mandy let the tears flow. Sweetie, it's okay. It's been an emotional day for you. You did a wonderful thing for that boy's mother. Remember that, Mandy. You brought that little boy home. No matter what her mum said to her, Mandy couldn't stop crying. Mum scheduled them an earlier flight home. She heard mum talking to dad on the phone. She was worried because Mandy wouldn't stop crying and, well, Mandy never cried. Hadn't since, uh, hadn't since she was a toddler. The flight was quick and she could feel her mum watching her as Mandy stared out the aeroplane window, clutching Mr. Happy, tears flowing down her cheeks. It was like every box of emotions Mandy had stored away deep inside herself had burst open all at once, and all her feelings were pouring out of her like an unstoppable waterfall. Mandy felt only a sense of deep sadness that she didn't think would ever end. All the emotions made her feel very, very alone, even though she knew her mum was right next to her. Even though she clutched Mr. Happy to be closer to Bobby, it didn't help. Nothing will ever help. When they finally got home, Dad was actually there, dressed in sweats and a shirt. He embraced Mandy in a big, warm hug. Mandy let the floodgates open up wider and cried harder. Mandy Bear, it's okay, he said. 
Everything's going to be all right. I know it's shocking what you've been through. Maybe we should call the doctor. I've never seen her like this. Mum was coming, unraveled. Her voice higher pitched than normal. It's been hours. She hasn't stopped crying. I don't know what to do. Mum always knew what to do. Dad guided Mandy to the couch and her parents sat on either side of her. Dad handed her a box of tissues, but Mandy couldn't look at them. She felt awful for acting like this, for her parents seeing her like this. She felt awful for all the crying, but she couldn't stop. She felt like a failure, that her parents were finally seeing the real her. The real Mandy, who was weak and depressing and a freak. The charade she'd been holding on to for so long was finally through, and she felt so guilty. I'm sorry, she managed to whisper. There's nothing to apologise for, Dad assured her and hugged her again. You're going to be okay. This will all pass. You're strong, Mandy Bear. You'll see. She shook her head. No, I'm not strong. Of course you are, Mum said. You're smart, you're strong-willed, and you're funny. You get the funny from your father, obviously. Mandy almost smiled at that, but she was so convinced she'd put on this act for so long that she disillusioned her parents. Mum, you don't know. What don't we know? I'm weak. I'm a freak. She pulled out a tissue and wiped her nose. Mandy Marie, I don't want to hear those words coming out of your mouth. Shh. Dad placed a hand on Mum's. Sweetie, you're not a freak. You're strong and unique and we love you for who you are. Mandy shook her head. They all think so at school. No one talks to me like the person. They call me names, say mean things. They put things in my locker. I'm a freak to them. Mum jerked upright on the couch. Who are they? I'll go right to the school and talk to the dean. We'll fix everything. Is it the Chandler girl bothering you again? She is so spoiled. No, Mum, I don't want that. Mandy's voice cracked as she said. I'm just so sad all the time because... I'm lonely. She saw her parents meet gazes, and then they reached for each other as they cocooned their daughter in a big, strong embrace. Whew. This is tough to get through. <laughs> Mandy told them everything. Um, she told them all about Melissa and her friends, the bullying at school and how she'd taken it for so long and never let anyone see how much it hurt her that she was lonely at school and home and that she wished Bobby was here with them and had grown up with her. Her parents cried because they wanted Bobby to be with them too. She told them about her online community and how she immersed herself in the game law because it allowed her to be part of something she loved and that she was accepted there. She kept the part about Stevie's ghost to herself because, well, that might really push her parents over the edge. True. <laughs> but she did explain how she pieced the mystery together and ultimately found Stevie. That after solving the mystery, she thought she would feel good, but after discovering Stevie's body, it just made her feel worse. After experiencing Mrs. Robin's sadness, it had broken something open inside her. It was an unloading of epic proportions, something she had never done. Her parents finally got her to stop crying, or maybe she didn't have any more tears left inside her. Her mum put her to bed, and Mandy fell right into a dreamless sleep. Mandy took the rest of the week off from school, and so did her parents from work. She couldn't remember the last time they were home together for so many days, just to spend time together as a family, without school or work involved. They wanted Mandy to see a therapist, and she told them she would think about it. After freeing herself of everything she'd been holding in, she felt lighter, and not as lonely as she'd once felt. Maybe that was what what brought Stevie to her. He'd been alone for so long, and so had she. Now they were both coming out of hiding. She felt as if she escaped something terrible and she was ready to live her life again. M&M &M Scoop Entry Number 225 I solved a mystery regarding the building that I discovered in FNAF 3, everyone. I thought it would make me happy, but it didn't. It actually turned into an extremely sad adventure, where it started off thrilling and exciting, and then finished in a way that was full of sorrow and grief. I've decided to not share details because something shouldn't be shared out of respect for families. I will say, I learned a lot during this investigation, and I will probably never know for certain how this mysterious building is connected to the FNAF universe. It could have been something as simple as inspiration. The only thing I am certain of is... If the creator wanted us to know, I think he would tell us. M and M. I can't believe you found Stevie Robbins, Mandy, Lindy said into the video call. 
It's been all over the news. You're like a hero here. My brothers are so jealous that you're my best friend. They told a bunch of people and now kids at school keep asking me questions about you. It's been a crazy few days. Manu smiled but shook her head. It was by total accident that I found him. Did you hear the little guy that had somehow broken his neck when sealing himself into the bear? Mandy recalled the dream when her hand slid into his neck. She shuddered. Poor Stevie, Mandy paused, then said. And just between you and me? Lindy nodded. Yeah? Promise you won't tell anyone? I promise. Cross my heart. Lindy crossed her heart on the video screen. The ghost boy? The one who'd been haunting me? It was Stevie Robbins. He somehow led me to him inside the bear. Lindy's mouth gaped open. Oh. My. Gosh. I don't really understand it either, but I can deny that it all must have happened this way for a reason. Wow. There is something I don't understand though. Why did Stevie show up in my FNAF game dreams? Is it because I found the photo in the game files? I mean, what is the connection between FNAF and Stevie Robbins' disappearance? She sighed. I guess I'll never really know the answer, and that's okay with me. On Monday morning, Mandy walked through the halls of Donovan Prep. Her purple hair had faded to a light lavender and was down past her shoulders. She felt different walking through the school. Her shoulders were not so tight. Her nerves were actually calm. She wasn't bracing herself for a verbal attack because really, she just didn't care what Melissa and her friends had said anymore. It felt like she had, hadn't been to school in a month instead of a week, and she was really looking at the school with new green and brown eyes. <laughs> the floors were wooden and glowing with a wax shine. Trophies and old pictures were gleaming from the glass showcase. Girls didn't, I either didn't notice her, or they weren't giving her a wide berth anymore as she walked by them. This was her school too. She had learned a lot here and she was going to make a point of enjoying the remaining school year before she graduated, as it was also time to look ahead and plan for a future. Mandy realised she had allowed Melissa to steal her school experience away from her. She allowed her to take her happiness when no one should have that power over anyone. Mandy walked to her locker and spun the combo. She opened the door and sure enough she heard a familiar voice behind her. Oh, look who's back. It's Macehead, the freak show, Melissa said, and giggles followed. Mandy took a breath and turned to face Melissa Ch uh, Chandler. Melissa's eyes widened. When Mandy leaned in close, Melissa had to tilt her head up and take a step back. In an incredibly calm voice, Mandy spoke to her. It's time for you to listen to me, Melissa. Mandy Mason is the only name you are allowed to call me. My name is not freak show. My name is not Macehead. I don't care who you are or who your friends are. Mandy looked at Lily and a couple of other girls, who just stared back in shock. You will not talk to me unless I'm facing you and have a conversation. Uh, unless I'm facing you and having a conversation, sorry. You will stay away from my locker and stop putting little ignorant pictures or notes or slime in my locker. Because if you do any more of that idiotic stuff, we will have a problem and I will not back down from you anymore. Melissa's blue eyes were like saucers, her face, face pale. I am done, do you understand me? Melissa made a smarmy face that basically said, yeah, right. But Mandy did not waver. Melissa and her friends no longer had power over her because she would not give it to them. Am I clear? She asked her, staring at Melissa's face and, and realising all this time she thought she was so perfect and pretty, when really she wore a ton of caked on makeup. That underneath, all the fake stuff. She was just a girl like the rest of the class at Donovan Prep. Crystal, Melissa said, and flipped her hair in an exaggerated turn as she sauntered away, with her gaggle of girls scurrying after her. Money turned back to her locker and saw a larger group of girls watching the encounter. In a sudden outburst, they started to applaud and whistle. Mandy felt her cheeks heat, and an embarrassing smile curved her mouth. Study period went smoothly. She didn't care that Melissa and Lily sat by her, only that they had finally heard her, finally realised that they could no longer bully or hurt her. Mandy did her schoolwork and she was, um, was happy when the bell rang to go home. She gathered her stuff and went back to her locker. When she opened her locker she gasped, not because there was another note or a slime shooter, but because her longboard had been returned. Good to have you back buddy, she murmured. She pulled it out with a book she needed for homework and closed the locker. A girl who had a locker close to Mandy's was standing by. Hi, she said. She had her black hair styled in two braids and clutched a couple books against her. Oh, hi, Mandy said. 
I'm Teresa. Mandy. She gave a shy smile. You were awesome this morning standing up to Melissa Chandler. That was pretty brave. Mandy shrugged. Oh, thanks. I'm just done with them and their drama. She nodded on understanding. I have a longboard too. Cool. Maybe you can show me sometime. Teresa smiled. I'd like that. See you tomorrow. Okay, bye. Mandy walked out of DP and rolled home, a smile on her face. That night, Mum was home. Mandy's parents had decided to work out a schedule so that Mandy wasn't alone so often. She told them they didn't have to do that, but they said it was time for some family changes. Mum wasn't going to be travelling as much, and Dad would bring some of his work home instead of spending so many late nights in the office. <clears throat> as Mandy was about to go up the stairs to her room, she heard a light tap at the front door. Frowning, she turned and opened the door. Mandy's eyes widened to see Stevie Robbins standing before her, whole, healthy and smiling. His colour was good, his brown eyes happy. She peeked over her shoulder to see if her mum was nearby, but she wasn't. Then she smiled at Stevie, the way he was supposed to look when he was a healthy little boy who once lived with his mother. Thank you, Mandy heard the words in her head. Mandy gave a nod. Stevie began to walk away. He turned back once more and waved. Bobby says hello. Mandy waved back as her heart clenched, watching Stevie disappear into the dark night. Whoa! I like that. Um, I see a lot of people, I, I've heard a lot of people's opinions on this story. Uh, obviously, I think they've only read the leaks, not the actual story. And they said that this is like the worst story in the world. I don't think it's that bad. Like, it's actually pretty good. Uh, it, it felt kind of similar, I guess, to Felix the Shark in the way it was kind of like a treasure hunting story for a lot of it. Uh, and it wasn't really a scary story either. And again, I don't think Felix the Shark was that scary of a story. Um, but it was good. I actually really liked it. Um, as I said, it was quite funny, honestly. I was laughing at quite a lot of it because it was like, oh, Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Damn, spring traps here. Uh, whatever. But I thought it was, it wasn't, it wasn't great, but it wasn't too bad. Like, I don't think it's the worst story. Um, I can see why it was cut, though. Uh, from the, uh, the other, you know, the other books. I can see why it's a scrap story. Uh, what I will say is one thing I just want to point out before I end, uh, is this? Yeah. Okay, so, one thing that I've completely forgot to say, uh, at the beginning of this book, which is, like, a huge thing that you need to know, is that this story was written by Scott Cawthon. Like, Scott Cawthon alone. This... The story wasn't written by an author. It was written by Scott Cawthon. Um, which may be why it's, l like, less good to some people, I guess. But also, it's, like, it's it might be Scott, like, trying to tell us some stuff. I will say I learned a lot during this investigation. I'll probably never know for certain how mis this mysterious building is connected to FNAF Universe. It could have been simple, something as simple as inspiration. There's a line right there. Oops, that's... Yeah, there's a line right there. Um, you know, like, not everything is going to mean something in the FNAF games. Yeah, uh, the, only thing I, the only thing that I am certain of is if the creator wanted us to know, I think he would tell us. I'm not sure if Scott would because, he, you know, he's gone silent. <laughs> he has retired now. But that is a good important thing to note. Like, if we're getting things... I guess, like, extremely wrong or extremely right, I think Scott would tell us, you know. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's just something to think about. Uh, the story was written by Scott. It was still pretty good, I think. Tell me what you guys think in the comments below. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. Next time, we're going to the last Fazbear Fright story. Can you believe it? The last one we are doing. You're the band, and I'm telling you, you don't want to miss this one. This is such a good story. So, uh, yeah, I will see you then. Goodbye.